Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified Podcast. My name is Lauren Wells, here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. We're committed to providing you with the knowledge required to build wealth through real estate investing. Tired of consuming content about real estate? Stuck in analysis paralysis? Ready to do your first deal? As a member of our community, you will learn how to go from consuming content to taking that first step into the world of real estate investing. Our show is not about getting rich quick, but about providing you with the knowledge you need to take action. Join us as we speak with experienced investors who share action tips on how to escape the corporate world, start a thriving side hustle in the world of real estate, and go beyond your W-2 or 401k. Welcome everybody to the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast, where each week we bring you education and information that will help you take your next step in building wealth through real estate. I'm your host, Lauren Wells, and joining me today is Mike Tahan. Mike actually quit his W-2 a few years ago with no plan, tried a bunch of businesses, then got into flipping houses and rental properties to chase passive income. He started out as a seller wholesale business the beginning of 2020, which again, not that long ago, to buy better deals. Now he owns 50 rental units in about valuing about 10 million in real estate. And he makes more passive income now than he did at his W-2 job as a Boeing engineer. So welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I think something that resonated with me, you know, when I was like looking at your bio and everything is like, wow, 2020 wasn't that long ago. You know, I think like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, better, great time to start, maybe not a great time to start. So can you talk about what went into when you left? Why did you leave your W-2? I guess we'll start there. Yeah. So that is always the kind of key focal point, I guess, in my story that I did things backwards from how most people view it or sort of like expect to do it themselves. So, you know, I I grew up pretty traditionally, went to high school, went to college. When I was in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I went into engineering, mostly because I started college in 2009. The economy was terrible. And the the first job fair I went to, I was, I went to Gonzaga University here in Spokane. You know, typically they have high recruiting rate with jobs, you know, it's pretty Mm -hmm. decent school. And I went to the first job fair and there was like seven companies there. That was it. And they were all looking for engineers. So I was like, well, cool. I guess I'm going to be an engineer then, you know, (laughs) like I I was not, yeah, that, you know, I was good at math and science and I wanted to be able to get employed. So struggled through school, kind of hated it. And like, was always led with when I start working, I'll like it better. Of course, it's not how it works. So I went into the workforce. Um, I first started at a consulting company while I was there for a short span. And then I got a job at Boeing, which was kind of like the dream job, I guess, you know, very high pay, super cushy, you know, you have all the good benefits. They have like a two week Christmas break, like everything that you could possibly want for like a, you know, traditional corporate job. Yeah. And I always remember the first day I walked into the facility I was working into. I was so excited. And, uh, you know, I pull up, go through like, go park. I go and walk through like the huge composite manufacturing facility I was working in, go up to the office. And I get up to the office and it is a dead silent, like just cubicle farm as far as the eye can see. And I was like, oh no, I've made a, I've made a grave error. This is not for me at all. But, you know, I just signed, you know, a general contract. I was into this job. And so I was stuck there for a little bit. And, you know, while I was there, I hated every second of it. If I'm being honest, like I never really had anything that I enjoyed. The one thing that I did enjoy, I guess the one thing I did enjoy about it was seeing the airplane manufacturing process is very fascinating, but the actual day-to-day work was terrible. And while I was there, I started getting into like financial independence, passive income, I would start listening to podcasts and, you know, reading blogs and that sort of stuff. And then finally, after a few years of that, I just said, you know, I want to pursue this with my Boeing job, just like absolutely draining me. I do not have the bandwidth to try and pursue it on the side. And so I decided I'm kind of done with this. I've been saving money to, you know, pursue like lean fire or whatever, and uh, decided to just jump and figure out what would happen next. So yeah, in January, 2018, I, I quit engineering. There's a couple other steps that sort of went on in the middle there, but I'll, I'll cut to it. January, 2018, I uh, quit engineering and decided that I was going to do literally anything else. And, you know, from there, there's a bunch of other stuff before I started, you know, buying houses, but I can, I can go into more detail with all yeah. that. Informal. Yeah. I'd love to see kind of what went in between you quitting and you starting to buy houses. Like yeah. what was that period filled with? Yeah. So when I first left, my thought was I wanted to get into, go back to school and get into physical therapy. So mm-hmm. I've always had a interest in health and fitness. I competed at a high level in Olympic weightlifting 
recreationally um, for years. And I was coaching that kind of as like a moonlight job while I was at Boeing. So I said, cool, I would like to make that what I do full time. Yeah. I went and got a job at a PT clinic, did that for a month and was like, wow, this is even worse than engineering just because it's like a insurance farm, you know, where you're yeah. churning people through and, and you're not actually helping people. So what I did is I, I spent the next year, honestly, I worked at a gym as a coach and I drove for Uber. And that was what I did while I just dabbled in different things, started reading a lot of business books. Me and my wife, we decided to take a little bit of a dip into our savings that we had set aside for our emergency fund. And we went to New Zealand. We traveled around for a month, I guess, to like find myself or whatever. And that helped me solidify that I wanted to have a lifestyle where I could take trips like that more often. And you know, that that became the goal was how can I create a business? I didn't know what that was going to be. How can I create a business that would allow me to have that freedom of time and that ability to travel, that ability to kind of do what I wanted. And over the course of the next years, I read a lot of books, wealth generation, passive income generation, real estate comes up in everything that you yeah. read. And so finally I was like, cool, how do I make real estate like the thing when I didn't have a real estate background, I didn't want to do renovations on properties. You know, I didn't know really the first thing was as I was learning on podcasts. And so, you know, that sort of like led into it a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. So you didn't go directly from, I quit my job to real estate. And I think yes. I took from that is, and something I think people who are maybe an exiting college or looking for their first job is intern or go like job shadow someone to see, because I feel like you think you want to do something or you're like, oh, if I'm an engineer, like, you know, it'll be better once I'm out of engineering school or, you know, I wanted to go be an attorney when I first started out. Luckily, I went through the LSAT class. I was like, I absolutely think I would love law school, but I think I would hate being an attorney. So, you know, it takes, you gotta, I feel like what you did going in, like kind of, you know, for the PT kind of seeing like, oh, wow, like this is not what I thought of when I thought, oh, I'm going to go do what my passion is. So love that. And then I feel like there's a couple of themes. There's like something you said in the beginning was this isn't the way most people do it, but I would disagree. I feel like there's two types of people. And I think it all depends on like your responsibilities that you have currently maybe mm -hmm. and your personality type, but the, you know, there's people that will leave it all and have to do that in order to commit and not feel like they have this safety net to fall back on and are just super committed to whatever that next play is. And then there's people that can build both. I definitely the former, so I resonate with you, but I know that there's people who can do both, but okay. So you went into real estate, you read all the books, you did all the things. What was your like how did you decide to go into like flipping and wholesaling and all of that? Or what was your first step and how did you decide that? Yeah. So originally, you know, all I knew was that I did not want to do renovations. Right. That's what I said to myself. No, and I was like, yeah. And I was like, I, I've never used a power tool. Like I, I had never like swung a hammer at the time. So I was like, and I was an educated, so I didn't understand that, you know, you go hire a contractor for that. I was like, man, if I'm going to flip a house, I got to learn to install kitchen cabinets. I don't want to do that. So what I did is I was like, cool. I want passive income. That was my goal. Yeah. And so I started looking at rental properties that were nearby and I wanted to find stuff that was easy. So it was actually, it was in the neighborhood, some uh, very nearby where my wife and I lived. There were these new construction homes that were going up and, you know, I started doing the math and I was like, oh, you know, this is like a great neighborhood. If I buy these, you know, for the price that they want, the mortgage payment is going to be like $1,100, probably be able to rent them for like 16 or 1700. Like I'm going to make like $1,500 a month, you know, or like whatever, like a thousand dollars, you know, yeah. $1,100 just like that. It's going to be so easy. So I liquidated my, my corporate 401k from Boeing. That was, Ooh, you know, just, let me just pause so, it. Yeah. yeah. Let me pause there for a second, because I, again, I am similar to you pretty much. And maybe because my parents were self-employed. So the whole company 401k was a very new concept to me when mm -hmm. I had my tech, you know, worked in tech and I liquidated mine for an oh, investment. Really? Yeah. And I feel like it was very much the unpopular opinion, but totally. today that investment has paid dividends in valuation of the property. So, you know, I think it's really mm -hmm. interesting and another not super popular thing to do, but I think for the audience listening your 401k is definitely a great investment and to each their own. But I always look at something like, is there something that it can do more? Like mm -hmm. if I'm pulling it out, is there a better investment that I'm making and putting it into? I'm not say, saying pull it out because, you know, you want to go on a trip, but if you can pull it out and have a good reason for why, I think it totally makes sense. Okay. I thought that was super interesting. So continue. Yeah, that's valid. And you're right. It was a very unpopular opinion when I did it. And I talked to so many people that were like, but the taxes and uh, yeah. the penalties. And, yeah. and I was like, I, honestly, for me, it was like kind of a, a middle
to the corporate world because I hated it so much. And I just wanted, it was like the last remaining thing, especially because of how the Boeing corporate 401k was structured. I couldn't transfer it to another IRA provider. I had to keep it there. Oh, okay. so I would always get these correspondence from Boeing in my inbox. And I would always get like these letters. I was so salty with it. I honestly just wanted that to stop. You know, I made kind of a rash decision, but also too, I wanted to get into these properties and I didn't, you know, I couldn't sacrifice the, the kind of the safety net that my wife and I put together because at that point I wasn't really making money. In 2017, I think I made $130,000, right? Like just me, you know, with my wife's salary on top of that. 2018, when I was working for Uber and I was a coach, I made like 17 grand, right? Yeah. So my salary literally reduced 90%. And I could not like take my safety net, put it into these properties. And I had this, you know, 401k. Yeah. So I said, this is where that money needs to come from. So I asked it, got into these rental properties. The mortgage payment was about what I expected. Threw them up on the market for 700 bucks. Of course, nobody wants them. The price too high. It was a pipe dream. I ended up yeah. leasing them for a few hundred dollars less than that. And then I realized, oh, well, I have property management, right? If I want to do that, I have vacancies. So, you know, I have these months where it's not getting filled. I learned that apparently you're supposed to have reserves for these sort of things. Yeah. It wasn't even on my radar, right? Because I was just, I don't know, taking massive action and trying to figure it out. Afterwards. Yeah. So that ate a huge chunk of my capital, but I was still having a little bit of money coming in. So it started to give me the bug. So I was like, how can I use this model to produce more income? I hear about people flipping houses. How could I potentially do this where I'm going to partner with people? At this point, I was kind of bought into real estate. So I'm like, I've never swung a hammer. I guess it's time that I learn. <laughs> but I started going to meetups and, you know, you go to meetups long enough, you become a face that people sort of recognize. You talk about having goals and ambitions. And I connected with somebody who was, I would say, equally ignorant to the process. They had money. I had time. And I was like, cool, let's start flipping some houses. So we started flipping houses together. And basically they would bring the cash. You know, it's like the definition of using other people's money. They'd bring the cash. We, you know, we'd go get a hard money loan together. I would do the project and then we split the deal 50-50. And that was ultimately how I got started in the off-market real estate process. That was late 2018, early 2019 range. 2019, we flipped four properties. The first property took us four months and I made $4,500. Lots of lessons learned there on what not to do. So it was a very expensive, I'm sorry, lesson. very low. Yeah, very, yeah, it wasn't necessarily an expensive lesson. It was a very low cost per hour <laughs> education and, uh, well, sorry, like low income per hour education. And, you know, each one, we just got a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And then by the end of the year, 2019, I was, you know, had become sort of like a regular buyer or I was regularly inquiring about properties from wholesalers. Yeah. So there was a, the larger wholesaler in town decided he was going to have a meetup for like the cool kids, I guess, or he brought like all of the more serious folks out to do like a meetup. It was mostly, you know, to build his buyer's list to all yeah. those sort of things. But I met all the people that I had been, you know, buying from or inquiring from in person. And I was like, these guys aren't that much smarter than me. I'm pretty sure that I could do what they do. And so that was like November, 2019. I decided I was going to be a wholesaler. And I started getting into the off-market game at that point. Okay. And so you entered wholesaling right before COVID. Like, let's talk about that. I, you know, I made the prior to uh, starting to record, I was like, oh, probably the best time to get into it. And you're like, yeah. mm, or not. So like, tell me about that. Tell me about kind of some of the pros and cons to starting your wholesaling business. And then three months, four months later, the world definitely drastically shifting, but mm -hmm. property values also skyrocketed. So they did. Yeah. And they yeah. skyrocketed, you know, 2021 really was when stuff started to get weird. So we'd already been operating. Yeah. So, you know, going into 2020. So when I decided I was going to do this, it was about Thanksgiving. I had my, my business partner who was my best friend from college and, you know, he had a strong interest in real estate. He owned a couple of rentals. He had money. Money. I did not. And so basically the arrangement was like, Hey, I'll figure out how to do this thing. If you can help seed fund it. Yeah. And so we decided to go into this endeavor together. We joined a mastermind that, you know, sort of helped us build the foundation of our business that is still the core of what we run today. And, you know, we're still actively involved in that group too. That's been honestly our best dollar for dollar investment that we've ever made. So we joined that to start getting the momentum going. Do you mind mentioning who's mastermind? Yeah. Yeah. So it was uh, Ryan Dossey. Um, okay. He has a, he has a group called Create Cash Flow. He's big on, on Instagram and those sort of things. And he's one of the few folks out there, I think, who legitimately practices what he preaches. Love that. Uh, but yeah. It's been, it's been a really, really great program. I, I would recommend to people that are interested in getting into this. So yeah, we built up the foundation for it. We started marketing off market in February of 2020. I, I will always remember the first day that like our, our mail and stuff started hitting because we didn't have like our, our system tracked, like set up, um, receive phone calls. Yeah. So my phone was just like blowing up. 
you know, like every hour or every couple of hours from people that were so pissed off that we were marketing oh. and everyone, like no one wanted anything to do with us. Like F you, all this sort of stuff, just like you, you normally get anyone that's done off market real estate, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. And the crazy thing was, I remember that I remember me and my business, we were so excited. We're like, it actually worked. People are calling us like there has to be somebody in here yeah. that wants to sell their, their deal. So that was February. When again in March, we, we sent out our next batch of mail. We spent $5,000. It was on like March 12th, right before the world shut down. And so we sent 5,000 bucks, went out, literally didn't get a single call to flush that down the toilet. That was a big issue. And, you know, at that point, I remember me and my business partner sitting in a coffee shop. It was like, you know, right before everything like fully closed. And it was like kind of the last day before they were like, okay, all restaurants, everything are closed. He's like, I think we're done. And I'm like, no, dude, like just keep putting the money in. We'll figure it out. And so we decided to go all in. And with COVID, always an interesting situation, right? Because yep. you couldn't do what everyone says where you go meet people in person, you know, you build rapport like that. So it was a lot of stuff over the phone. Um, it was a lot of learning how to do due diligence from your house. And it was very challenging to learn because there weren't a lot of people that were teaching that yet. But honestly, I think it was extremely beneficial in the long term because it's allowed us to build the fully virtual business that we have now because we were forced to. Yeah. But yeah, so then we did that. It took us about four months and $30,000 worth of spend before we finally got our first deal. So we were in the hole pretty big. And the I first deal we- super important to note too. Mm -hmm. And I know you said this before. One, I think of going back mentioning like, I only made $17,000 dollars. Like I wasn't quitting my job and, you know, raking yeah. cash immediately. So I think that's important. And then right here to say like you, again, like you put a lot of cash into it before you started seeing, you know, a deal come through or a potential deal. Yeah. And for timeline on this for two. So from when I left my corporate job at Boeing to when I signed my first wholesale deal was two and a half years, right? So it's a yeah. very long period of time. It was early 2019 to the middle of 2020. Yeah. So we, we finally were $30,000 in the hole. We got our first deal. We had a, a buyer that we had been expecting to sell stuff to. We we're trying to get a $15,000 fee. The guy beat us down, said, I can only do $7,500. We're like, that's fine. We'll take it. Here's the deal. The guy proceeded to vacuum the carpet, throw it on the market and made 85 grand. So we had a, a big lesson learned there of making sure that uh -oh. we're analyzing opportunities. <laughs> but anyway, so we went through over the next couple of months. We, uh, that was in like June, next couple of months, we did a few more deals. And then in October, we had our first six figure month all for wholesale deals. And I'll remember the October 31st is my birthday. I turned 30 and my parents were out for my 30th birthday, hanging out with them. And I remember sitting with them and I was like, I think my life has officially changed. Like we just made like $114,000 in a month. That's more, that's like as what I used to make as an engineer. In and a year. In a year, yeah. We just, it just used to, we just made that in a month. And there's no way that I can explain that to anyone this year because it is was such like a, you know, surreal feeling. Yeah. And, and we took that money, we piled it into the business and we have scaled pretty significantly since then. Yeah. And I think there's two things that come into play with real estate. You need deals mm -hmm. and you need capital. And yep. there are people out there who are the deal bringers and the work behind it. And there's the people who are the capital. And then you have a combo of both, obviously, and some people. But I love that you partnered with someone and you have that strategic partnership that benefited you both. You know, he had the capital, you had the knowledge to make this work. And yeah. so I think that is something that when people are looking to get into it, like know that you don't have to do it all alone. You're probably not going to be able to do it all mm -hmm. alone. And you're better if you can find a good counterpart to work with you. Yeah. I want to catch you too. It was actually a she that I partnered with at the start. Oh, nice. I just like, I just like to give credit there because yeah, you know, it's such, such a male dominated it business. Is. She, she was awesome. Yeah. I want her on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost contact with her. I should see if I should. If I oh, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And I think something that you, again, it's how do I explain this to people? Because you're yeah. like, how did this happen? You, obviously all the hard work and everything. That's how it happened. But mm -hmm. when it happens, when something like that happens, you have that record breaking months. It's like your aha moment. Like I can't go back. Yeah. Obviously you were committed two and a half years committed in to get like your first deal. But you know, once you really have that moment of like, wow, this is, will change my life. Yeah. It's how do you explain that to people? You know, it's weird. Right. And then also when it's only happened once, you don't know if it's a fluke or not. And we were very intentional about, you know, when we 
we said we made that money. We were going to be disciplined about not taking draws because we had a bigger picture. Yeah. This. So our goals were always to buy as many, buy doors, right? Wealth generation yeah. was the ultimate goal with this thing. Yep. We already recognized that you can produce a bunch of revenue from wholesaling clipping. You're going to get wrecked by taxes. That's not going to lead to the freedom yep. that we both wanted. And so when our goal, I guess I'll say when we got into the off-market real estate, our goal was not to buy, was not to wholesale. It was to buy discounted properties and do the Burr method, right? But once we got into that, especially when COVID happened, financing got really weird. And all of a sudden the turn rate on Burr properties was long. So we would get these opportunities that came in that we literally couldn't take down. So that's, you know, we'll like, We'll start wholesaling those. And as we built out that process, ultimately we went to the properties that we don't want, we'll just wholesale those ones and then we'll keep the stuff that we like. So for us, you know, that's like A class single families and multifamilies. So that's what we built our portfolio in. And, you know, because we were wholesaling such a large volume, the turn rate on that money is so quick. Like, you know, we would make 50% of what we could have made if we flipped it, but it would take three weeks instead of four months. Yeah. Right. So the velocity of your money is extremely high and we yeah. would wholesale all these properties and we would just dump more of those into rental properties. So that allowed us to build a lot of the wealth and success that I, I now carry into this period where the market has kind of turned versus like, I know a lot of people, especially in 2021, they were just wholesaling everything. Cause you could like, you know, you could get a yeah. lead on a cardboard box sitting on the corner and you could sell that to somebody. I'm in California. Yes. You probably could. <laughs> And for right. like a crazy amount. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, so that was kind of our model. And then, so going forward, 2021, we started to scale. We uh, we did, I think it was 58 deals. I personally had my first six, seven figure year in 2021 after, you know, making $18,000 three years before that. We, uh, we bought a ton of our properties that year. You know, we benefited very greatly from the market. Like, I can't lie about that. We definitely did. Yeah. And then going into 2022, our plans were to try and scale outside of our local market because we had kind of like saturated it. We measured all of our KPIs and we were at a phase where the dollars that were going into marketing were leading, leading to lesser and lesser return. So we said, cool, how can we start doing this in Midwest markets and other places? We started doing that and had some good success. And then as that started to build, you know, we started to get recognition yeah. and traction from other investors. And that led to a big part of our business now, which is the a vertical integration with our wholesaling business, which is essentially a, uh, it's like a wholesale for hire. So it is a marketing and sales focused business where if you want to find off-market deals in your market, but you don't want to do any of the back work, you hire us, we come and we launch a branch in your market. And then, you know, you pay us a monthly fee to run it. We get a very small portion of the deals and then you get all of the upside, but we run your data, your marketing, your sales, everything before the signed contract we are in charge of. And ultimately you can just have a turnkey business that yeah. launches, you know, in a couple of weeks, instead of doing what we did and spending six months trying to figure it out. And that sounds like it's perfect for someone who doesn't want to leave their day job, has yeah. the money, you know, to pay you to do all that up front. So again, you're kind of capitalizing on like, hey, I'm really good at like doing the work and knowing what needs to be done. I've like mm -hmm. have this great system, finding the people who are stuck in their day job, don't love it, but can't leave, but have the money, but want to leave. And then mm -hmm. they can find you. So one question I want to back up a little, how, when you decided to expand outside your area, your market, which is mm -hmm. where you were familiar with, you know, where you live. How, what were your criteria when you were looking? Yeah. So one of our, our, our criteria has kind of always been, we try to find a hot market and go to a tertiary area. So for example, if you're going to go to, I'm trying to think of what would, what would be an example that everybody might know. Atlanta. At, I don't ask. Yeah. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I just know Atlanta's a hot market, but okay. Yeah. So, uh, so okay. Let, let's say you're going to go to Austin, Texas. Okay. Very hot market, right? Everyone knows yep. that. If I said, I'm going to go and try to wholesale Austin, Texas, everyone's like, damn, that's crazy. Like, no way you're going to do that. If I say, hey, I'm actually starting up a wholesale operation in Round Rock. Okay. Round Rock is about 20 minutes from downtown Austin. Yeah. So what happens is you start targeting there. And so we try to find these little pockets of areas that are close enough to key hot areas where there will be a strong interest, but not so not so on the map that like everyone that's ever listened to a bigger pockets episode is going to go there. Yeah. Right. So, you know, same with like Nashville. I forget the names of the places over Nashville. It will do in Knoxville. So like instead of Knoxville, we do like Naperville and some of these other little towns that are like yeah. around the out of it, right? Um, or we started doing some stuff in Chicago. We started working in some of the suburbs, Aurora and Fairfield and these different areas that no one's ever heard of because they're like, you know, an hour away from Chicago, 45 minutes away. 
But people that are buyers there that are going to be our end buyers, they're like, oh yeah, I'll buy a house in Aurora. That sounds great. But you don't have all the other virtual wholesalers that are trying to get deals there. And the great thing is too, there are a ton more markets like that versus like the key market. Key market. Yeah. So, so I always, always go on these shows and people like, or like, you're just giving away your markets. I'm like, there's tons of them. Like there's tertiary markets everywhere. And there's like, you know, a hundred million houses in the United States. There's tons of opportunity. What would you say are starting out some of the things you had wished you had done differently? One of the things I wish I had done differently was focused more, especially when we started, was focused more on the sales and the rapport building side of the business. That's honestly a reason that we struggled to start was, you know, both me and my partner were both engineering minded. We would go into these different opportunities. We were focused on the house. We're a real estate business. We want to talk about the house. So we're going to walk in with this seller. We're going to be like, yeah, so, you know, we're going to have to do the kitchen. Like we got to fix the mold in the bathroom and all those sort of things. This is why we can only offer you 130000 for your $200,000 house. We did not talk to the seller about how her husband just died, right? About how her kid has a drug addiction and, you know, needs to get bailed out of jail about how she has a health problem and she can't pay the absorbent health bills, right? Those are the things that get deals in the off-market space, right? And so what we would find is we were regularly losing out to people that were having those challenging conversations and that Mm -hmm. were focused not on the deal, but on helping the individual that inquired, you know, because ultimately wholesaling real estate, it is not a real estate business. It is a marketing and sales business and is a solutions business, right? And so much time goes into helping the individuals that are involved, like we say distressed sellers and people that aren't distressed, they see that as taking advantage of people. Honestly, the stuff that we do, the people that we assist, most of the time they are in such a bind that it's not that they, you know, don't have any other options. Like they could go get a lawyer and those sort of things. They don't have the means to, they don't have the education to. And so we spend an incredible amount of time on just helping people with their dirty laundry. Yeah. Right? And we didn't approach stuff at the beginning with that mentality. And when we made that shift was honestly a big way that a big time that uh, lots of started to change. Yeah. I mean, we buy distressed mortgage notes. So, you know, yeah. you similar know situation, is. like, and our goal is to work with the borrower to keep them in the property. And a lot of the times, like you said, they don't have the means time or wherewithal to go and figure out how to get out of their current situation. And, you know, larger institutions are, I always say in the business of creating debt, not really managing the debt. So, you know, we find that we're able to go to them and yeah, we get a discount on the note. Of course, you know, that's why we're in this business, but we're able to work with them and say, Hey, we can make something work for both of us, like make it a win-win. So I do think, yeah, it is the whole business from finding the deal, sourcing the deals, working on the deals really stems from that ability to have good sales and marketing or build rapport, essentially. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, especially when they start this, in fact, a lot of people that are like contractors or they're realtors and they're doing sort of things and, and they want to get into this side of the business and they're not willing to put in the time to, you know, sit with the, the seller at their coffee table and, and talk about the problems that are going on. They're not willing to, you know, spend the time to talk to their attorney to figure out why, you know, the probate situation is such a mess. Or, you know, we've had to do things like there's four next of kin. We're only talking to one. The other three aren't even around. We have to discover that two of them are dead. The other one now lives in West Virginia. We have to go track her down on Facebook, talk to her about the situation, convince her that it's not a scam and to call the yeah. title company and convince to go through all this that. stuff. <laughs> like, honestly, we do no. these things all the time. There's so much detective work. And that's why we're able to make such good money is because yeah. there's process to it, right? Yeah. And, and every deal is different, but that's also why we can make, you know, like on a house where a realtor isn't going to be bothered. You're going to make like four grand. We can have that same deal and we're going to make 40 grand. Yeah. Right. Because there's a lot more of a challenge goes into getting each one done. Let me ask you this, because obviously we're in a much different economic climate than we were when you were entering kind of Mm -hmm. real estate and getting started. If you were to lose it all today or start over today, you left your job, say, what would be your play now? Knowing what you know, having that real estate background, would it still be wholesaling? Would you look into a different avenue? Kind of what would be your play in this time, in this environment, but with your knowledge? So so it would be the same thing. I think that my exit strategy would, I guess my, my plans for my exit strategies would be a little bit different. When I started, the whole philosophy was if you find a deal, buyers will find you. So true. Like back in 2019, yeah. 2020, that yeah. was absolutely the case. If you had a deal, people would raise their hand. Now with interest rates being weird, you've had some people that have gotten bit by some projects. The real estate bug has kind of faded. You kind of need to do things backwards. So you need to connect with those. Like, I guess what I always tell people, and we have we have some group coaching stuff that we do. We always coach people, if 
you don't know what to do, find your good buyers first, right? Find the people that are still flipping markets in the turned over economy. Find the good realtors, a lot of investor clients and negotiate your deals based off of what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. That eliminates a lot of the risk and the guesswork from signing stuff around and not being able to find a buyer. So that's like how I would focus on this business. But the core of it, I would do the same because what we've built in the whole marketing and sales process is an extremely valuable asset, whether you want to wholesale or not. Like if you want to syndicate multifamily properties, you can use the same processes. If you want to buy distressed notes, I'm sure there's very similar stuff that we could do to target distressed note holders, honestly. I mean, it's probably a little bit more complicated because you have to work with the institutions, but yeah. you know, I like, like there's ways that you can identify properties so you know which institutions yeah. to talk to, right? And learning how to build a marketing and sales funnel like that is extremely valuable in everyone's real estate business and is something that you should actually con consider including in some capacity. Yeah, focusing less on just a specific deal and more on the business aspect of it, I think is something that people like exactly. instead of focusing on how am I going to get this property? How am I going to make my return? How am I going to get that passive income? There's so much more that goes into getting to that point. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's great that you highlight that. So I always like to ask this question at the end of the podcast, you know, if you were to give our listeners a piece of advice who are looking to get started, maybe they've consumed 10,000 hours of content from podcasts, bigger pockets, books, all that. They have a day job. They don't have a day job, but they're looking to get started. What would you say would be like your number one action step you would take or tell them to take? Um, I tell them to find a coach. Honestly, if they are somebody that are like they're educated and they're having issues pulling the trigger, find a coach, find someone to keep you accountable. And when I say, you know, find a coach, like don't go to one of those things where they like bring on a conference room and they're like, I'm going to, you know, take your credit card right here. Like that's nonsense. Find people out there and they have them for every niche that you feel like you vibe with as a person, you like the style of business that they're running and you want to be like them. And even if they don't offer coaching, reach out to them and see if they would be willing to help you out. Because here's something else too. People that have a public sphere, like a public persona they put out, even if they don't offer coaching, they are doing that because they want you to interact with them. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. Like yeah. Be, like even now I get people, it's like my podcast has started to grow and everyone always DMs me and they're like, I'm so sorry for bothering you. I'm like, do you think that I am doing this? Cause I don't want you to interact with me. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Don't bother me. I don't want to, I'm putting myself out there. Yeah. So you don't talk to me. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. So that's a that, good that, point that no one's ever brought up, but it's so true. Like yeah. I always go on these podcasts and I'm like, here's my, like, here's my email, reach out mm -hmm. directly. Like I wouldn't be on a podcast if I didn't want to communicate with people or hear if someone has a question, like that's what we're, you know, especially in like the real estate space. It's not like yeah. we're, you know, like, like I'm, a, I'm an Instagram model trying to, <laughs> I don't know, get likes. Like I don't have the face for that. You know, I, I like, it's not, it's not how it works. And a lot of real estate people, if they're putting the time into creating any sort of presence, you know, presence that they're on your radar, reach out to them and see how you can potentially do some stuff together. So especially yeah. like, like the analysis paralysis folks, I think that is a great way to kind of get over that hump. And a lot of people, they get into that, especially now where there's oh, yeah. so much real estate education content out there. Yeah. There's so many people that are professionals at real estate, but they haven't done anything. And yeah. it's because- they haven't been pushed off the ledge yet. Yeah, no, 100%. I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us. If people wanted to reach out or connect with you, how would they do that? Yeah, so I have my own show. Um, it's called the Collecting Keys Podcast. You should definitely go and give that a listen. It's uh, we, we do like three shows a week. So we do interviews on Monday. And then uh, on uh, Wednesday, we do me and my business partner, like talking shop, just oh, talking Chris more and about- Oh, I were talking business. about you guys. Oh, wait, really? Whoa. Yeah. Because for those listening, three podcasts a week is yeah. like next level. Like you guys <laughs> are turning, like, I remember he was like, yeah, he does one. His business partner does one. And then they do one together. And I was like, mm -hmm. every week. Wow. Like bravo. That's, I mean, definitely go give that a listen. You guys, that's some good work. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. If you want to know the secret, the secret is to like, get ahead of your interviews. Yeah. Right. So like, so we batch like a ton of them over like two weeks, which pushes out a couple months and it's a lot easier to maintain going into the future. But uh, yeah, collecting keys is the name of that podcast. You can go and find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. And besides that, the best way to connect with me directly is on Instagram. It's just that Mike underscore invest. One of my goals this year was to do 300 Instagram posts. So I'm really doing my best to try and make regular content. How many are there. you at now? So I've missed a total of of I think like 11 days for the year. Okay. So, so however many that is, I, oh, I'm you heard going, it here. 
You heard it yeah. here, folks. <laughs> Got a lot yeah, to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm counting the days I miss. It's counting the 60s easier, or 65 yeah. easier than counting the 300. Of course. But uh, yeah, shoot me a DM on there. I'm always happy to chat with people. And uh, seriously, don't apologize if you DM me. Like, I'm doing this because I want you to reach out. So Awesome. Well, thank you again, Mike, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of the CWS Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, subscribe, reach out to us, or leave a review. Until next time, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you for joining Lauren and I on this episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Each week, we bring you expert education, experience, and information in a digestible format to help you identify investment opportunities so you can build wealth through real estate and take action toward your financial goals. Enjoy the show share with a friend or subscribe to the show and leave us a review.